On an overcast morning in early June, I set out with my friend Yvonne to visit Rick Jor, a true Montana mountain man. Living on the slopes of Mount Hardin in the Mission Mountain Range, Rick harvests and mills cedar from his land and raises West Slope cutthroat trout. His pure strain of cutthroats began as a childhood hobby, which bloomed into a lifelong passion. Today, Rick shares with us his story while he gathers eggs and milt. So good to see you again, Rick. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I want, I want to introduce you to my, to my friend Yvonne. Good to see you. Glad you could come up today. So what are we doing today, Rick? We're going to spawn these West Slope cutthroats that I raised. Awesome. And take some samples for the biologists who are doing my health inspection. Part of the requirement of the commercial license is uh, an annual health inspection. I took fish to Idaho recently, for example, and the state of Idaho is familiar with my fish, but before they give an import permit to the Idaho Cust client of mine, they have to have all my health inspection papers for three years. So do they test what you feed them and all that other stuff too, or do they just look at their, the state of the fish now? No, they test, they take samples, they're gonna kill 60 fish of each age group, and they'll take tissue samples, different tissue samples, and send it to the fish health lab in both. So we, we cover the whole state. We're the fish health program located out of Great Falls. And our, our area of responsibility is the entire state, but we're in Great Falls because it's right in the middle. It's centrally located. But we're in charge of maintaining the health of all the state-owned fish. So all the fish in the state hatchery system and all the fish in the wild fish in the rivers and streams in Montana, so maintaining the health of them, that's, that's our primary responsibility. And you do the private hatcheries? We do private hatcheries because when private hatcheries stock fish all over the state, there's a potential for spreading diseases that, you know, we need to, to make sure they're not spreading things so that we can protect our, you know, the, the state fish uh, from, those, from those risks. And what kinds of things do you test for? Today we're testing, we have a, a standard uh, suite of pathogens. We're looking for uh, three bacteria, three viruses, and one parasite. That parasite really? being whirling disease, so that's our standard certification inspection. We're not looking for any bacteria, we're looking for certain bacteria. Um, you know, so we're not saying they're, they're free of any infectious organisms, we're just looking to rule out the really big, important ones that we're, we're real concerned about. And does that do a good job of keeping those infectious things at bay at the state? It does a reasonably good job. You know, there's always risks. You know, the, the one thing we've got to understand is anytime you move fish, you know, you risk moving something along with it. This program is designed to, to help minimize those risks, to help manage that risk, but it does not remove those risks. There's always the risk. You know, there's a risk that we're going to miss something. You know, the methods aren't perfect. Um, and, you know, we're testing a subsample. We're testing 60 fish out of a raceway with 200,000 fish in it. So, um, yeah, so it's it's not perfect, but it does a, a you know, reasonable job of, of maintaining those risks. So if we're moving stuff, you, 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 like I say, you've got to accept some level of risk of moving things. But this is kind of that happy medium. It does a, it does a pretty good job, um, but it's certainly not perfect. So. Um, I've been doing this almost 25 years. Tyler's been with the program for about two years now, so, yeah. You guys, I, it's quite a lab setup. I'm pretty impressed for in the field that you can do this. Yeah, so we're, today what we're doing is we're, we're collecting tissue samples. We'll, you know, uh, the different samples they go in different bags and tubes, and then we, you know, put them on ice packs, and we'll ship them to, overnight to a lab. In Bozeman, the Fish and Wildlife Service has a, lot of, a regional fish health lab in Bozeman. They'll actually do the testing. They'll run the, the assay, the tests, and, and, and give us the results. We're basically just mobile sample collectors, go around the state, work with various people in various waters, collect the tissues, uh, submit them for testing, and then, and then coordinate the results and report them. This is a young female, so she's probably not ready. 
see if I'm ready for this one. Oh, Jeez. oh wow. <laughs> I like this. Oh. Rick likes big fish in Canada. We just lie. need to get the first little bit of fluid coming yeah. out of there. Oh, okay. dear. This guy's gonna have a long way. Oh, the eggs. Are you kidding me? What is there, 300 eggs in here? Way more than that, really. About a thousand or so? Yeah, over a thousand. Oh, goodness. She may have, they've been yeah, spawning in the sad. pond. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. So she, she more than likely <laughs> laid some of her eggs in the, cause there was, I've got that pawn drain down. She been barking all over. Okay, that was the second fish. Yeah, you, you keep track and then when we get five, I'll show you what we gotta do. Third. That's what fertilizes the eggs, bud. This is a dad fish. That's all it takes, huh? That much? Yep. Doesn't take much at all. It's interesting. I know like you probably gutted out fish when you've seen those white strips up here. Yeah. Remember the testicles? Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh, well, you didn't get much fluid. It's just eggs. Well, yeah, big. and that's... And this, this is not unusual for cutthroat. In the wild, like in these creeks where they grow, they're 10 years old and six inches long. In some of these mountain creeks like this, see? She's probably eight inches. You can see the cutthroat real nice on her. But that'll be one of my future broodfish. Over the next three, four years, I'll get a lot of eggs out of her. So, see now this little female, I can tell by feeling, I can test her, but she's just not ready. She just, the eggs aren't entirely separated yet. They're still clustered. So this is one of Rick's ponds. He ponds the stream as it comes off the mountain. And he's got a series of ponds where he raises the trout uh, all summer long. How beautiful is this? Here's one rising right now. <laughs> Just gorgeous. Yeah. There's another one rising. Yep. All the big ones are down in the raceway to be egged, spawned, uh, <laughs> tested. <laughs> tested. <laughs> so Rick throws a net into the pond and nets them to bring them down to the raceways. Just gorgeous. We are more or less at the foot of one of those huge Mission Mountains, uh, and the land goes up steep behind us. Just an incredible facility. Beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh. Total natural environment to raise trout in. I guess. <laughs> so Rick, how long have you been propagating uh, the West Slope Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, used, I started when I was 13 years old, but even before that, we had fish in the bathtub. <laughs> My brothers and I were fishing pools, and we walk all over fishing, and sometimes we'd bring fish home just to watch them. We had gravity flow water up here, so we put them in the bathtub. What did your mom say about that? <laughs> My mom was a very patient lady. <laughs> she put up with a lot. But we couldn't take a bath for a couple weeks in time, so. <laughs> But I actually talked my dad into pushing out my first fish barn when I was 13. And uh, so I've been playing with fish. I hate to admit how old I am, but that's 50 years. 50 years. <laughs> And so how many of these do you raise a year? I, last year I took about 600,000 eggs. It's looking like this year I'll end up with about 500,000. And that's not to say that all those are going to end up fish, but 
on a good year, you'll I'll have a good 80 to 90 percent hatch. Oh wow! And then once I get them out, if I can keep the predators out of them, <laughs> I, I do. I feed my share of predators. So you sell these West Slope cutthroats all over. You sell them in Montana, you sell them in Idaho, any place else? I do. I've sold fish at Washington also, and then I've actually shipped eggs back east. Oh, wow. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember. Ten, uh, even uh, uh, Maryland. The state of Maryland bought some eggs from me one time. Wow. And so how long does this process take today? I know you've been at it for a while before I got here. It's an all-day deal. All day. Yeah. Yeah. So these, you, these fish were in a pond that, that we had to net this morning. I didn't want to keep them in this raceway any more than they have to. It's hard on them in here. And so I didn't net them until this morning, so we started net about 8 o'clock and got them down here so I could run them. And it'll be late this afternoon when I get out of here. So we, we took a walk up to your pond. So you have a series of ponds. Yes. I've got seven ponds total. And the water flows out of the Mission Mountains? Is, is this a particular creek? Is it this creek? This, this is, well, this water in this raceway actually isn't part of this creek. It's uh, different springs that are, this is overflow from the water I use to make my power. It's actually separate springs from that creek. Wow, so you make all your own power? I do. Power these pumps? Well, this is gravity flowed water. We, I don't pump any water up here. It's all gravity flowed, but we've got three. I've got a hydro system because it's so steep. We've got 370 feet of drop where that water, where I pick it up, and I power the electrical needs for my home, that Airbnb rental there, and then my dad's house also. So we've actually got three places on that system. Wow. Off the grid. But yeah, it's all from the missions here, and uh, I'm pretty sure we're the highest private property on the mission. So it's all wilderness on three sides. So, so along with fish propagation, you also have your own cedar lumber mill. I know because we bought some cedar. Yeah. It's awesome. Well, we're fortunate enough to have this 160 acres, and as you can see, being wet and kind of on the north slope, I'm going to say 50% of the timber on it is cedar. Wow. So I kind of specialize in some cedar. Cedar boards. I'm very careful not to cut too much. I, I'm trying to manage it for the future. Did you know where these fish were first scientifically recorded? No, I did not. I'm a big fan of Lewis and Clark. And Lewis first recorded the, the West Slope Cutthroat at the Great Falls of the Missouri. Silas Goodrich was a member of their party, and Lewis commented in the journals that Goodrich was fond of fishing. And he would often provide them with fish for, as a change of diet, because uh, they ate so much meat, you know, coming across the prairie. And Goodrich started catching his cutthroat at the Great Forest. And Lewis recorded them in his journal. So the scientific name of these is, and I, I uh, should know it, but I don't. It's uh, Lewisy or Clarky Lewisy or something like that. So why did you choose to propagate cutthroats that way? When I was a, a youngster, my dad would take us fishing. I vividly remember, and I'm thinking I was probably 11, maybe 12 at the most. And we would catch these little fish in these cricks. 
my brothers and I, and Dad just happened to mention, even that long ago, that there was talk of these cutthroats being kind of endangered or threatened. And, that, and so, for some reason, that put in my mind that one day maybe these cutthroats would be kind of rare or I wasn't really thinking of making money on them. I, it was just a hobby for me. And so I ended up just avoiding ever putting any other fish in my ponds. I just put, ended up putting a cutthroat in. And, and, uh, so where did your strain come from? They're, they're, uh, they're all from the this particular area. The small drainage is right here where there are isolated populations. So from the bathtub to the dug ponds to the raceways. Yep. <laughs> so how often do you get grizzly in here? Well, grizzlies come by often, but we very seldom see them. But they don't cause the problems. Black the black bears are more of the problem. The grizzlies seem to find their manners. It, it just seems to me like. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the bear did? That's the grizzly. Well, he tried to go through the garage door and then he decided to go through the, the sidewall too. Oh my good lord! Oh wow! You know what I'm like, but here's a bunch of freshies. Oh! Look at that! He's got a protective seat, the light doesn't shine on him, but here's here's an incubator for eggs. Oh I just That's all in. Wow. Two hundred thousand right there. And so he's got the water running real soft so it doesn't actually move any of the eggs because they're too fragile and they'll get damaged. Mm -hmm. And then once they once you can see the, the eyes on them. That's what he calls eye and out. And then you can run the water through more aggressively and it helps them get cleaned and, and keeps the fungus down. Cool. So they keep it dark in here intentionally? Yeah, because if these are exposed to the light, they, they're supposed to be you know, in the gravel and stuff, and so if they get exposed to the UV, it'll harm them. That's why he's got this kind of protecting from the door. So you're really simulating the natural yeah. experience that the eggs would have. Yeah. I've never seen him have to really do that. So why did the bear want to come in? Because there was a whole, there was, he can smell all the eggs, plus all of the, the little guys, and he was thinking he was going to have caviar for dinner. <laughs> wow. And then all, all of the, all of the uh, granule is the, is the fish food, but then all the little stringy pieces is the fish poop, actually. And then all of the little pellets are, uh, bug larvae that are going to hatch out and they make all the fish with their mouth down on those as soon as they hatch out. So you wow. guys feed these fish bug larvae? Uh, when, when they hatch. Yeah. See these, those are live, but they're too big for the fish to eat at this point. Oh. So it's not fake food. No, it's real thing. Real deal. So where do you get the bug larvae? Well, they, they, they are naturally occurring in the ponds. And they, they lay all their, their eggs, I guess is the term, on the rocks. And so we go scrape them off the rock. And then we can let them hatch out. And the fish love them. And, yeah. Oh my goodness, that's awesome. He, his, his water's colder and he allows them to eat as much natural food as possible. And it results in a smaller but hardier fish. And so if you, if you, if you hatch egg, his eggs here in the 40, low 40 degree water, it takes upwards of 40 to two to 45 days to hatch. But if he takes them down into the valley at the rainbow hatchery, yeah. it's like eight to 10 degree warmer water and they'll hatch in like 30% less time. But his fish, like the ones we just saw that he was harvesting eggs out of, I mean, these are pristine fish. The fins are beautiful. Right. They're very healthy. The skin glows. Right. 
It's not like the stuff you normally see at some hatcheries. It's because they're a hardier fish because they have they struggle a little more in the colder water and their okay. metabolism is slower and they grow slower. That's cool. That's cool. It, it can take him it can take him a year and a half to get a four inch fish. Whereas the rainbow hatchery, because they're warmer water and the, and the, the synthetic food they yeah. feed them, they'll, they'll grow a four inch fish in six months or four months. So you don't feed fish pellets at all? Try to avoid it. Try but to avoid it. When, when you have high, high fish density in the ponds, you have to feed, but try to feed as little as possible. Remember from biology class how heart beats? <laughs> It's the stimulation, it's the apex of the heart where the nerve bundle is. The camera don't ask me what it's called. Chicken actually. This one's darn near still beating. The chicken. You can poke it and you can stimulate the heart. Beat. That one's kind of cheating because it's it's kind of still beating, but you can you can take a fish and have it on ice for a half an hour. It's been dead for a half an hour. Pull that heart out. Poke the tip of it just like that and watch that heart, watch that muscle contract. So cool. Thanks so much for showing us this awesome operation. Well, thank you. I, I enjoy it. I appreciate the chance to visit with you. Oh, I'm sure I'll see you again because we'll be close to you. Well, that's good. And I appreciate your videos.